Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Niagara United Mennonite Church and our service this morning, whether you're watching at our live online service on YouTube later on through the week, or if you're watching through our Pleasant Manor or Kojiko uh, broadcasts, we're glad that you're here. Hey, did you know that at our online uh, live service, uh, we have a tab on our page that allows you to read scripture while you're watching through the service, whether that's watching our pastor Daniel Jansen preach or anyone else is preaching and you want to just check out some scripture for yourself, uh, you can click on the Bible tab on our page and that will uh, take you to a uh, side-by-side scripture reading so you can just check things out for yourself and see what you think. And you can do that at any time uh, during our online service as well. Uh, we're thankful that you're here. Some stuff to let you know about before we get our service underway this morning. Uh, we were going to have a young adults bonfire night tonight, but between the rain that's going to be happening all day and uh, just the rising cases of COVID, unfortunately, within uh, this particular demographic, we're going to cancel that bonfire night tonight. Um, but we will be in touch with you about an alternative uh, sometime in the future that can take place. If you have any questions, you can contact me, uh, chris at redbrickchurch.ca. If you're at Pleasant Manor, you might have noticed we haven't had bulletins available in the last little while, and that's because there seems to have been a miscommunication at some point about who's getting the bulletins and making sure uh, people get them. So that's been rectified now. Uh, if you would like a physical copy of the bulletin that we make for Sunday mornings, uh, you can get them now on Fridays between 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. at the office at Pleasant Manor from Cheryl. And when you're there, you can also get uh, things such as uh, Life With Us, Daily Bread, or um, any other materials uh, that we provide. You will only be able to get one copy of each material, and that's just to prevent people from going room to room uh, handing out stuff to others. Uh, we want to make sure that everyone stays safe uh, during this time. Hey, something I almost forgot to mention, even though we may be in a season where as things get colder, we're going to be spending more time indoors, perhaps as cases of COVID-19 are rising, we may see things more distanced, uh, perhaps uh, not doing as much uh, during the season. In this season, home churches are still reopening. And if you wonder what home church is, home church is a group of six to 20 people, intergenerational from any age and stage, who meet once a week over a Zoom call to connect, get to know one another, have spiritual conversations, have fun together, and just do church outside of Sunday mornings. Uh, we feel that Sunday mornings are great. They're great for communicating a message, seeing each other in a larger community sense. But we grow best when we connect in smaller, more purposeful, intentional groups where you can actually get to know people really well and you have more opportunity to do creative things such as serving in the community, wondering what's something new we can do to serve people in our church. When, you have a, when we have a smaller, more focused group uh, that has time to be able to do that more, we find more creative things happen. And so we have two new home churches that are starting uh, after Thanksgiving weekend. And I'm very excited to let you know who they are. Uh, first of all, we have a home church that's meeting Tuesday nights, 7 p.m. over Zoom call, and that's going to be led by Jolene Carter. And uh, they are going to be looking at a book by Henry Nowen called Following Jesus, Finding Our Way Home in an Age of Anxiety. So there will be a cost for obtaining a book uh, for that course, but uh, we'll see if we can find you uh, a discount somewhere for that. Uh, John Teeson is also leading a home church on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. Uh, his group is going to be called The Road to Philippi, Thriving Outside of Our Comfort Zone. Uh, both appropriate topics right now, I think, for this time that we're heading into. If you would like to connect with either one of those options for home church uh, through the week, you can contact me at chris at redbrickchurch.ca. Uh, or you can uh, shoot me a text if you have my cell phone number. Uh, just let me know that you'd like to connect, and I can certainly make sure uh, you make it out to one of this group, one of these two groups. Uh, we think it's going to be a uh, great value for you, uh, especially during this time when we feel more disconnected uh, outside of uh, church on Sunday mornings. As we head into not knowing what may happen with COVID in the winter, uh, we feel like this is just a really good proactive option to uh, make sure you're connecting with people, uh, make sure we're being creative in community. If you've been saying to yourself, hey, I just wish uh, we'd be doing this as a church, a great way to uh, follow through on that and find other like-minded people is to connect with a home church. We think these are gonna be uh, really high value for you and only takes an hour and a half out of uh, your week. Um, if you can make it each week, that's optimal. If you can only make it every other week, 
that's still good to make it out. If you can only make it once every three weeks, that's still good. We feel like something is better than nothing uh, in terms of connecting with people outside of the church. Uh, so if you'd like to know more about Home Church or you'd like to connect with Home Church, just shoot me an email or send me a text and we will let you know more. Hey, with all that uh, to let you know about, I'm going to read us a call to worship and then I'm going to pray and we're going to move into the rest of our time together this morning. Well, all heaven and earth proclaim the majesty of God's creative power. Praise God for the amazing and awesome beauty of his creation. He's given us an example by which to live together in harmony and peace. In the person of Jesus, God has summed up the ways that we must respect one another. Rejoice in the goodness of God. Praise God for God's complete and steadfast love for us. Let's pray together. We give you all thanks and praise, O God, for you have made us your own through Christ Jesus and given us a new righteousness based on faith. You created the entire universe. The sky tells of your glory. Day and night reveal the genius of your ways. You brought your people out of slavery and gave them your laws and commandments that they might be rich in spirit and clear in vision. Though we repeatedly rejected your ways and destroyed your messengers, you sent your son to us to renew heaven's call. Though the crowds recognized him as a prophet, those who coveted his inheritance seized and killed him, but you raised him from the dead. And now through the power of his resurrection, he stands as the cornerstone of righteousness, the first fruits of the kingdom, and the incomparable prize towards which we press. Therefore, with our hearts lifted high, we offer you thanks and praise at all times through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Good morning, I'm Austin. And I'm Niall. And we got married on September 12th during COVID. So we kind of just wanted to talk about um, our wedding and how things went and just kind of update you on our lives because Niall moved down here um, in March when all this started. So we haven't actually had the chance to come to church as a couple and be um, together at church as a couple. So we just wanted to give you just a quick recap of where we're at and um, how planning a COVID wedding went. Okay, so Niall and I got to be in a wedding party together on June 8th of 2019. So just about like what, a year and Goodness. almost a half ago. And we were partners in the wedding. And so we met at this random wedding in Dundas and it was actually a Dutch wedding. So um, both of our friends happened to be Dutch. So it was crazy that we got to meet at this wedding and that, so Niall's half Mennonite and I'm fully Mennonite. So it was just it's so exciting that we got to meet and um, be from such a similar background at a place that we didn't expect it. So um, we kind of got talking and when, when we were talking at the wedding, we realized that actually our grandparents, so my grandma Ellie and John Penner, were good friends with Niall's grandparents, Rudy and Louise Thiessen in Vineland. So that was such a cool discovery too. And then we kind of just hit it off right away. And Niall was from Huntsville and I am from here. So I kind of just wrote it off and we thought, oh, we wouldn't really connect. And then it turns out that that summer, Niall came down like almost every weekend and we just really hit it off. So in March, we decided to um, stop with all the long distance dating and for Niall to move down here to Niagara. And it just so happened that that time coincided with everything with COVID. So now I was down here and then we thought a couple of months went by and it all was going so well. So we ended up getting engaged in June of 2020. So like basically just a year after we had met at the wedding. And so then after that, we thought, well, why not just have a COVID wedding? <laughs> okay, so planning a COVID wedding, some people would think 
I remember, well, it was only like a three month process. So in the past three or four months, people would say, oh, we give you so much credit for planning a COVID wedding or like, oh, this must be so hard. But the beauty of our situation was that we got engaged when we are, were already in the heart of COVID. So all of our expectations were in line with um, kind of having a lower key wedding, having less people. And um, that was something that we actually wanted to bank in on. We didn't want a huge wedding. We didn't want a wedding with the normal expectations. So we decided the date of September 12th, and then we basically had five weeks to plan this backyard wedding that Niall had wanted from the beginning. Then it turned <laughs> out that we got it. So it was so nice. And so my parents, when they called the tent rental and the catering and um, just basically everything, well, Mark and his team did video and photography, but everyone was available because no one was planning things or hardly anyone was planning things during COVID. So everything, boom, 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 fell into place so perfectly. Overall, we loved it. It's fantastic, right? yeah. Yeah. Uh, my favorite part of the wedding probably was, well, seeing Austin for pictures first thing in the morning, but uh, also hearing all the speeches, all the nice things that people had to say about us. Was definitely my favorite. Yeah. Yeah, that, we love the speeches. We thought, every, well, it's nice when people are just showering you with positive words and making you feel loved. We also loved just that it was small, so then we didn't feel like we were completely up front and center. We were just kind of in my parents' backyard and it felt like a, like a relatively normal day. Um, and then I think my favorite part of the wedding was, first of all, we got, Niall and I got to meet at, um, in the commons before our ceremony. So we had a whole hour to spend just walking together and taking pictures. So we loved that. And it was just so cool to be able to absorb our wedding day before we saw anyone. But as a whole, the whole wedding day went exactly as we had planned and it felt more, more joyful and loving than I all, even could have imagined, even with kind of high expectations. So, but then it was COVID, so we had kind of low expectations. So it was just a perfect balance. Um, and yeah, we were just so grateful for how it all went and for the fact that we get to be married now and starting a life together. So we're so happy that we got to share just like a little snippet of our lives this morning. And um, we can't wait to see you when it works to see you uh, as a married couple. And to get to know you. Yeah, and for Niall to get to know you and to settle into um, to life together and with our community. Good morning again, everyone. Happy Sunday. We're glad that you could join us again for our music segment, or possibly you're watching our whole service. That's great. Hey, is there anyone out there that would uh, like to join us in our music segment? You can either join our selfie cam jam, or you can put your own video out. Either way, it'd be great, because we're looking for more people and more variety for uh, our church services. So um, if you can help us out, that would be absolutely wonderful. So until then, um, please enjoy our selfie cam jam.
Good morning. I'm here with Aria and she's just got home from her gymnastics practice and she wants to show you something that she's practiced very hard and can do very well now. All right, go ahead, Aria. sweetie. And now she's also working on something that she hasn't quite mastered yet. Ari, what's the skill you're working on now? My kit. Her kit. So she's going to show you where she's at and she hasn't quite got it yet unless she gets it right now, which would be the very first time. Ah, so she's working on it, but she's not quite there, which is awesome, but she's been trying very, very hard. Okay, Ari, come have a seat for a minute. So the reason I have Ari show you those two things is because I wanted to talk to her about working hard at something and then seeing a result. So the very first thing that you showed us, what was it called, Aria? It was called my routine. Your routine, like your casting or something like yeah. that, right? So it's called casting. And she worked very hard on that. Now, was it easy at first? No. No, how long did it take you to learn how to cast? It took me the three or four months. Three or four months to learn how to cast. What would have happened if after month number one, you're like, oh man, this is too hard. I can't do it. I quit. Would you ever have learned how to do it? No. No, but now you're pretty awesome at it and you're pretty proud that you can do it too, right? So her same mentality goes for the kit that she's working on. She's been working on it for a very long time and she's almost there and probably in the next few weeks. What do you think, Are You think you'll get it in the next few weeks? A few days, she thinks, which would be awesome. So the reason she did this is because there's a parallel to today's Bible verse. Um, the scripture reading from today is from Philippines. Philippines. Philippians. <laughs> and it talks, it's a letter from the Apostle Paul to the Philippians. And he talks about being a Christian and how it's difficult and how it takes practice to get better and better. And sometimes we make mistakes and we make mistakes almost every day. And sometimes we kind of get stuck on those mistakes. And we dwell on those mistakes. But at the end of the letter, he talks about getting better and better and better. Kind of like Arya's gymnastics. So think about being a Christian. Are we perfect people? We make mistakes all the time, right? I make mistakes. Arya makes mistakes. Mommy makes mistakes. Jerry, the dog, might make mistakes <laughs> sometimes. We all make mistakes. But it's important not to focus on those mistakes. We can learn from those mistakes, but remember that God always forgives our mistakes as well, right? As long as we ask for forgiveness. And we should focus on moving forward and trying to be better people and better Christians every day. All right, so if we put the same effort into our Christianity and our relationship with God as Ari does with her gymnastics, we'll be making some pretty good progress. So hopefully the next time Ari does a children's story with me, she'll have her kit mastered by then, which would be pretty cool. All right, have a great Sunday. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church, as a righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. 
I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, Forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Philippians 3, verse 4b to 14. Some years ago, I was uh, having a conversation with some friends or was trying to enter into a conversation with some friends and it didn't work out because they were talking about celebrities and their lives and what was going on and I was blissfully unaware uh, and they thought that bliss is not something that I should be able to indulge in especially in regards to celebrities in their lives and so they took to trying to teach me about celebrities and what was going on so that I could engage in conversation with them. They went at it for about seven hours or something like that. We were on a ferry together and so there was no escaping and they failed, mostly. Mostly, I say, because today, if some headline story is about a celebrity, there is a pretty good chance that I might open it up and at least scan through it because it has made the headline news. And this occurred not, well, maybe just about over a couple of years ago, back in, I think, December 2018. One of the headlines that was making the news was that Kevin Hart had stepped down from... Uh, I guess hosting the Oscars um, because he had made some homophobic comments on Twitter so many years earlier and these had come to light and so the public was crying out that he should not be able to host it and in response to this criticism he decided to step down from hosting the Oscars. I don't know exactly what he had said but in the apology that he issued the day after these uh, comments had come to light uh, people, his critics, did not deem it sincere. And which brought actually a really interesting, I think, conversation uh, to light or up to the forefront, at least for a short time. The question was, can people change? Do people change? Um, Kevin Hart had said that he was a different person today, or a couple of years ago, than he was when he had made those comments. I think it was about eight years prior to 10, 2010, 2011, if I got my numbers Correct. And he said he wasn't the same and many people did not believe him. They sort of asked the question, can a leopard change its spots? Yes. The answer is yes, if he moves from one spot to another. Now, uh, more seriously, I think it is a significant question. Can people change? Uh, we ask this question a lot in the world. Is real change possible? Um, does a bad decision made by someone make, that, make them a bad person or an evil person or an irredeemable person? Um, is forgiveness possible? Is reconciliation possible? Do people change? Can people change? Can we escape from our past? Are we ever to be identified with it? My name is Daniel Jansen, and I am a pastor here at Niagara United Mennonite Church, and I believe that change is possible, that people can, in fact, change. And I believe that people can change because I believe in Jesus, and I believe in the proclamation of the gospel message. Because our whole, I guess, the centrality of our gospel is that people can, in fact, change. People can, in fact, choose to be different. If we go, if we start in the Old Testament, the question that the Israelites were constantly asked, well, was, which God do you intend to serve? You know, which God will you serve today? We have that famous line in the book of Joshua, you know, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. You know, choose you this day whom you will serve. 
And if we move to the New Testament, when Jesus steps onto the scene, the first thing that sort of comes out of his mouth, out of his mouth, is that same style of question. Um, from, I believe it is from Mark's Gospel. Uh, it, uh, in Mark's Gospel, it says that Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Repent, as you probably heard so many times in your life, means to turn. To turn from one direction to another direction. To turn from the way that you are going to another way. Yes, people can change. We can change. I mean, I can change and certainly you can change as well. But a bigger question might be is, you know, do we want to change? Um, and I hope that as Christians, our emphatic answer is yes, we do want to be changed. We do, in fact, want to be different people every day because we want to grow more in the likeness of Christ. And that will cause more of Christ to enter into our lives and more of sort of the, I guess, some of the more fleshly or earthly or non-Christ-like um, behaviors and attitudes and thoughts to disappear from our lives. And so we've changed and looking more towards Christ and less towards our former bad habits and ways of being. And so then the next question is to say, yes, we can in fact change. And yes, we do want to change. Then the next question is, what does it mean to change? Um, what do we do about our past? I mean, we're changing from something to something else. So what do we do about that part that we've turned from? Um, and what does it look like to move into the present and into the future? And here to help us answer that question, we have Paul and his letter to the Philippians. So let's take a look. In our section of text um, that we have here with us today, Paul continues to air and address an area of tension in the church being caused by certain individuals who are seeking to cause Paul harm. And we talked about this the last week, and I think we touched upon it uh, even two weeks ago. So if you want to like get an update on that, I encourage you to um, either read Philippians chapter 1 and 2, or even catch up on the sermons from the last two weeks, because we're sort of building on them. Paul is writing to a Philippian church, and they are predominantly Gentile believers. So that is... Um, believers, um, people who have come to faith in Jesus from outside of the Jewish tradition. So Paul himself was a Jew um, and had come to faith as a Jewish person. And so he's a Jewish Christian. And now he has become a minister to uh, Gentile people. And the Philippians are a Roman colony in Philippi. And it's to him, to them that he is writing this letter. Previously, to be a part of the family of God you needed to obey the entire Torah. And that included things like circumcision. And these um, laws and practices, uh, in part, were to signal that you are part of the family of God. But as we read and as we know from um, Acts chapter 15 in the council in Jerusalem, is that when the faith community came together and they were debating the merits of um, the Gentiles and whether or not they would have to become Jewish, that is, take on all of the Jewish law, including circumcision, the council there said, no, they do not need to be circumcised. They do not need to keep all the commandments, all the uh, ceremonial and religious um, practices. Uh, they did specify some other things that they should do um, in keeping with uh, the Torah and the laws and the commands of God. But some of these outward identifiers, um, they did not need uh, to keep because their new identifier as a people of faith was Christ. Christ in them, the in Christness of, um, of a people of faith. That was the new marker, the new foundational sort of sign and the thing of the people of what brought them together. So in verse 2, um, Paul commands the Philippians to watch out for some of these uh, Judaizers, um, a group, a small group of Jewish Christians who believed and were um, going around telling Gentile believers that they actually did need to keep the entire 
um, Torah, the entire law, including circumcision, in order to be a part of the family of God. And a part of their messaging of trying to convince the Gentile believers that they needed to, in fact, be circumcised was their credentials, you know, their standing with inside the family of God, you know, being of a certain tribe in Judah, being followers of Torah, or being strict followers of Torah, keeping all the commands, and saying that, in fact, you know, we need, you need to do all these things if you want to be a part of the family of God. And so, Paul, in writing his letter to the Philippians, says, you know, two people can play this game. He says, listen here, first, you know, I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. You know, these are my inherited qualities. I was born into a good and righteous family. You know, if I, if there could be a Hebrew with um, the best possible sort of like chance of being the right person with the right credentials, I have it. I was born into the right family into the right line, a good tribe. My parents were righteous and they did all things according to the law. And secondly, of my own accord, you know, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. These are my accomplishments. You know, I was raised right, but then I took my faith on by myself, you know, and I followed the strictest, when the strictest um, law-abiding, um, I don't know, sex or like divisions of Israel, the Pharisees, you know, they were very particular about trying to keep the law very explicitly, very literally, as close as possible to the letter of the law. They were righteous and zealous to be faithful followers to God in all acts of their lives. No matter how simple or how strange it was, they were going to follow God's law. And they were had an active and zealous faith, you know, like you could say of like Phineas, of Eliezer. You should check out that story um, in Numbers chapters, Numbers chapter 25, I guess starting in verse 7, it talks about Phineas and he was zealous for God. And Paul says, I was zealous for God like that man. And not only that, I have never been charged with trespassing the law, blameless as to righteousness under the law. You know, I have the perfect, I have the right heritage, but also my life in Judaism was right. I was keeping the law 100%. You could not find a more faithful, righteous, devout, model Jew in all of Israel, is what Paul is saying. If you want to compare credentials, I have the best. You can't get better than me. I have all the boxes ticked. However, Paul says, now, I'm no longer a part of the Jewish community of faith. I am a part of the Christian community of faith, which includes Jews, um, not to get that mixed up. But my, as a part of the Christian community of faith, what matters, what is significant, what is awe-inspiring are not my credentials. They are none of these things. None of these things matter in relationship to being in the community of faith, as being a part of Christ, as being in Christ. All of these things are comparatively meaningless, which is great, Paul says, which is absolutely wonderful because I was a persecutor of Christians, of Christ's servants, of this community of faith. And for me to be a part of this community of faith, I don't know if I could have joined them. I think I would have been barred from entering this community of faith because of my past, because of my zeal zeal previously. But in Christ, those are past is not nearly as meaningful. It is irrelevant in comparison of being in Christ, of following Christ, of knowing Christ. And that is good news, Paul says. Thanks be to God. The older identifiers and the credentials matter very little about in our future life with God, in our credentials with Him. He sort of phrases it this way in his letter. He says, if you were to take all my previous credentials and place them on a table, you know, and they would be stacked up really high on, in, for Paul because, you know, he was an uber, uber person. And then we took on being Christ and we put that on the table. And if we looked at both of them, 
the only place, the only fitting place for all my credentials were to be, were to throw them in the rubbish heap. That would be their proper place in regards to having a being in Christ. That is the great divide between these two things. So the question is, has Paul's past been erased? Paul's past being erased? Does it cease to exist? Does it no longer play a role in his life? No, it hasn't been erased. Paul's past is Paul's past. And it's an integral part of his story, his witness, and also his ministry. It is, however, not what defines him anymore. It is not what shapes his worldview. It is not what directs him anymore. Christ has transformed his past to be used in his future and to be used for God's future. You know, Paul is the first theologian, one of the first person to put down thoughts about God and how God and Christ wrought salvation, both for Jews and Gentiles alike. And he employs all of his credentials and he brings up, or he employs all of his credentials. He uses his heritage, his um, upbringing, you know, his tradition in the Jewish faith. He uses his education and training, excuse me, to argue and to show how, in fact, Jesus is God's Messiah. He uses these elements in his faith or elements in his past for his new ministry. And so God transformed these skills, these gifts, these things for a new purpose. He repurposes them for ministry in the kingdom of God. But not only that, Paul uses his own story of being a persecutor of the faith to show the Philippian believers that God can change anybody's life. He's, in one way, he says it, you know, if I can be transformed, if my life can be changed, if God in Christ can transform my life, this one who is the worst of sinners, who is deliberately trying and going out there, trying to destroy the new work that God was doing, then God can change anybody's life. Then God can redeem anybody's life. Paul in chapter 2, verse 12, he commands the Philippians to work out their faith in fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work his good pleasure. And that is what Paul is doing. That is what Paul is allowing Christ to do with his past, to use it as a tool, to use it as a witness, to use it as a story of God's redemption for the mission of God. Paul is saying, look at my life. If God can redeem me, then he can redeem anybody. He can redirect anybody's life. So, do people change? Can people change? Yes. Yes, I believe they can. And I believe Paul is a witness to this. Can we escape from our past? I think, yes, we can escape from our past as well but only if we let Jesus' light shine on it. You know, Paul's life was transformed when Christ's light shone on him and exposed him, and he did not try to hide it. He went forward with his life as a new creation, a new in-Christ in person, with a new in-Christ future. His past was his past. He couldn't change that. But he didn't let it define who he was going forward. He didn't hide it. He didn't deny it. He didn't lie about it. The good and the bad of his former life. But it also did not have the power over him anymore because, in fact, he let Christ's light shine on it and he did not lie about it anymore. Another way that sometimes we express this is, you know, nailing it to the cross. And so Paul, he nails his past to the cross. And he lets himself and his past die with Christ so that he might be resurrected. He might be raised to new life with Christ and new mission and a new purpose. 
And so Paul continues, he says, not that I've already obtained this, not that I've already obtained a resurrected life, or I'm already perfect. You know, Paul is very well, that, very aware that he still makes lots of mistakes, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider that I've made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind. Um, I strain on forward to what lies ahead. I press on towards the goal of the prize of the upward calling of God in Jesus Christ. And then he continues on in verse 15. He says, let those who mature think this way as well. Let us too think this way as well. That God can change us. That God does change us. And God can change us. And he can transform us all of our lives and all aspects of our lives. But in order to do that, we need to reveal to God, we need to let God's light shine on it and not to hide it or to lie about it anymore. Let us pray. Father God, we give you thanks for your son Jesus, who in himself took on the sin of the world, which brought his death but you raised them up to new life. And we are told that if we too give our lives to Jesus and we nail our sin and our, and our lives to the cross, that we too will be raised up to new life and into abundant life, not only in the life to come, but right here and right now, that you will transform our lives. And this we pray. In Jesus' name, you will do in us. Amen. I want to thank you for joining us here at Niagara United Mennonite Church. And again, I hope that our service and our ministry has blessed you and continues to bless you in your lives. And that you too may be encouraged to know that you can in fact change and that God can do immeasurably more in your life than you can ever hope or imagine. And now, may God's peace, who brought back our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, make us complete in everything good, so that we too may do God's will through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen.